Hi, and welcome to chapter 12, section one. Can you believe it? We have reached our last video of this class. Oh my goodness. Here we go. Let's do this. So in this section, we are looking at linear regression again. So we first started doing linear reg regression in chapter three. This was when we had like two variables, made scatter plots, and then we tried to fit a line of best fit to it. So with linear regression in a t-test form, we're basically looking at the slope. We are focusing on the slope of that linear regression line, that least squares regression line, if you remember, the LSRL. Um, so we wanted to see what the slope could possibly be. Um, as a hypothesis test, we're kind of looking at the slope in terms of um, being able to tell whether there would be a relationship between the two variables or not. Um, and to do that, um, our hypotheses are basically going to say something like um, that we there is no relationship between the two variables or that there is. Um, when there's no relationship, we're saying that that slope should be zero. Because if you think about a slope of zero, it would be just a horizontal line if you were to graph it out for that line of best fit, which means that your points are kind of scattered all over the place in your scatter plot. So um, that's kind of what we're testing for here. But before we get started on an actual example, let's write some stuff down that would help us go through the entire hypothesis test. So for our hypotheses, our null hypothesis is always the equal sign one. So in our symbols now, we use the letter beta. So this is a, the capital Greek letter beta, um, where B, if you remember in your least squares regression lines, B was the letter that we used to stand for the slope. So the population slope um, would be beta. So we're saying equals zero for the null hypothesis and that it, oh sorry, totally wrote down the wrong number. So our alternative hypothesis is that beta does not equal zero or it's greater than zero or it's less than zero. So that's your number that you're going to use most of the time for our linear regression t-test. Because if we're trying to ask is there a linear relationship, um, if there's no linear relationship then that means that slope should be zero. Sometimes the problem will actually specify what slope that they actually want. Um, so like between the two variables, if they're saying um, one grows at the same rate as the other, then that slope should be one. Or if it's a negative relationship or positive relationship, that's when you would use the greater than or the less than symbols. So in our hypotheses that we mentioned using beta as the symbol to stand for the population slope, in general, our sample data, when we first looked at um, any data with two variables, making that least squares regression line we did, um, we use the symbols y hat as the predicted y value equals a plus bx, where a was that constant or the y-intercept, b was the slope, and then x was your x variable. Well, with population data, um, we no longer have y hat because if it's for the whole entire population, this it's not really like a predicted value anymore because for population, we're not predicting anything. So it's just y equals, and then we use alpha, plus beta x. So alpha and beta here stand for the population y-intercept and the population slope. I do need to point out though, this alpha right here is not the same alpha as our significance level. I don't know who chose these symbols to use for this, but these are two different alphas. So that's the only annoying part for this section. All right, so before I go on to do the example, I do want to talk about what the sampling distribution of beta would look like. So remember, sampling distribution is when we are taking a bunch of samples of a similar size and um, looking at the mean or the proportion, whatever the parameter is. Um, and out of all of those samples that we have, being able to graph it out and see what the distribution looks like. So here, if we are looking at one sample and that sample slope, we can then also look at many other samples and the slopes of those samples when we collect those two variables, make the scatter plots for each one, figure out what the slopes are, and then plot all of the slopes of all the different samples together. That would create this sampling distribution of beta. So the center, um, the center, the average um, of all of the slopes should be what the population slope would be. And then the spread is um, like that standard error formula, except here the formula looks like this. It would be the standard deviation of the population 
over the standard deviation of just the x variables times the square root of n. So if you kind of blocked out this standard deviation of x part, you would get sigma over root n. This should look familiar um, as another standard error formula when it was just one sample. Um, and then the shape of it is, remember, we want to do calculations when, when it's normal. So it's approximately normal if y varies normally for any fixed value of x. So this one is awkward because um, if you imagine all the different slopes um, and then for each sample that we have, then when we actually use that linear regression for that sample, that least squares regression line for that sample, um, we would be able to use, you know, plug in a certain x value and figure out what the predicted value of y is. Well, for every sample, you're going to end up with slightly different least squares regression lines, so each of those predictions for y should be slightly different, even though you're using the same value of x. So what we're saying is that distribution of all the predicted values of y, as long as those are normal, then the shape of the overall sampling distribution should also be approximately normal, which is kind of hard to check for, but we'll talk about that in a little bit. All right, so in order to perform a hypothesis test now on this population slope, um, the conditions for it, the assumption slash conditions, is way different. So in the past, we've always just looked at random samples, independent samples, and normality. Well, because with a linear regression, anything with linear regression is much more complicated because we've got two variables instead of just like looking at the mean or something like that. So with more things to look at, there's obviously going to be more conditions. I've tried to kind of turn it into an acronym so that it spells out liner. Um, also because when we're dealing with least squares regression lines, then liner hopefully helps you remember what all the conditions are for this specific test. So starting with the L, the L stands for linear. So that means X and Y as your variables have to be linear. In order for us to check that x and y are linear, we would need to look at the residual plot for these two variables. And remember, in a residual plot, we want the points to be scattered about. So we don't want any sort of pattern in it. So you'd have to make a residual plot and show that or state that there's no pattern that we see, so x and y are linear. The next thing we need to check for are independent observations. So basically, um, for each data point that we have, the x comma y, it shouldn't affect what the next data point should be because you know they're independent of each other. The next condition is that it needs to be normal. So this is the one we were talking about earlier with the shape. So for any x value, y needs to vary normally. To check for that, what you want to do is make a histogram of your residuals because your residuals should tell you what the differences were between your observed y value and your predicted y value. So if your residuals are approximately normal or specifically no obvious skew or outliers, then we can say that um, our distribution is also going to be normal. The E stands for equal standard deviation. So the standard deviation of Y, which is the sigma symbol that we were talking about earlier in the spread, should be the same for all X values. The way to check for that is to look at the residual plot again. So we, when you do your um, checks for your conditions, you've already made a residual plot up here, so you don't have to like draw it again. You only have to draw it once. But you're looking at the residual plot. The absolute value of each residual should be about the same. So in your residual plot, um, basically you're looking for no fan pattern. So remember, a fan pattern is when it like starts out small and then gets wider as you go, or the other way around starts out wide or you know, far from the x-axis and then gets closer to the x-axis. So each of those residuals should be about the same height. So again, we want that like scattered pattern or lack of pattern. And then R is our favorite one. This is the random sample. We just need to check for random samples or a randomized experiment. Um, so this one is easy to check for. You're looking in the problem. Does it give you a randomized experiment? Did they tell you it's a random sample? That's it. So let's do an example together. So in this example, we've got, is wine good for your heart? You know, valid question. Um, so at, a, at UC San Diego, 
Um, a researcher collected data on average per capita wine consumption and the heart disease death rate in a random sample of 19 countries for which data were available. The following displays the data. So here's all our data points. Is there statistically significant evidence of a negative linear relationship between wine consumption and heart disease deaths in the population of countries? Carry out an appropriate significance test at the alpha equals 0.01 level. So here we're given you know, a set of data with two variables, so we know this is going to be a linear regression t-test. All right, so in our phantom process, obviously we start with stating our parameters. So our parameter here, we're looking at the true slope. So beta equals the true slope of the relationship between and then our two variables, which is wine consumption and the heart disease death rate. Then we get to state our hypotheses. So for our null hypothesis here, because we are looking for whether there is a negative linear relationship, then um, the null hypothesis would be that there's no relationship. For our alternative, the beta would be less than zero in order for it to test for a negative linear relationship. All right, so our next step is to check for our assumptions and conditions. So what I've done to, so far is just typed in all my data into L1 and L2, where L1 is my alcohol from wine, um, and the L2 is the heart disease death rate. So here, uh, we want to check for linear, which means that we need to look at the residual plot and make sure that there's no pattern in it. So to make a residual plot, first I have to make sure that I actually run linear regression in my calculator before it'll calculate residuals for me. So stat, go over to calc number 8, will be our linreg. So x list is L1, y list is L2, go down to calculate. Great, there's my least squares regression. Um, from there, I want to make sure that I set up my stat plot correctly. So I'm going to turn it on make sure it's scatter plot is selected. And then my X list is L1. My Y list though, because I'm trying to plot residuals needs to say resid. So in order to do that, remember this is second stat and then go all the way down until you see resid. And then that'll say resid there. I'm gonna quit and then zoom nine to make sure everything fits nicely. Um, this is, there's my residual plot. Um, so looking at it just now, it's not the greatest because if you can see, um, we've got residuals out here that are smaller, but then residuals towards smaller values of X are kind of spread out. So not the greatest residual plot, but we're going with it. So for the linear here, there's definitely not too much of a pattern we can mention. Like there is kind of a fan pattern, um, but otherwise, um, we are going to continue with our hypothesis test, but be careful that um, this data might not be good to begin with. All right, so I've drawn out a quick sketch of my residual plot, and then I'm just gonna state, I do see a slight fan pattern because I am acknowledging it um, as X values decrease, but overall it is still considered linear because we have um, kind of a good spread of the residuals. Next, checking for independence. Um, each country's alcohol consumption and heart disease death rate can be assumed to be independent of each other. So again, even if you're not sure, just say that you assume it um, because these are assumptions slash conditions. Next, to check for normality, we have to make a histogram of our residuals. So going back to my calculator, um, currently I have a, a residual plot, but now I wanna change this to a histogram. So I'm just gonna Choose histogram instead of X list being L1. I want that to be residuals. So make sure it says resid and then zoom nine again to make a graph. Cool. All right. So yeah, no extreme skew here. No outliers. Fantastic. Do this quick sketch. And then we have approximately normal. All right, next we gotta check for our equal standard deviation. This was where we looked at our residual plot again, so I don't need to sketch it out again because I already have it from up top, but I do need to mention there's a slight fan pattern. This is exactly what we don't want in equal standard deviation. So I'm gonna say it's not quite equal. Um, proceed with caution, because we're still gonna continue with the problem, but we need to acknowledge that there might be an issue here. And lastly, random samples. This was given to us in the problem because it says a random sample of 19 countries. Fantastic. Okay, all right, so naming our test, this is the linear regression t-test. They told us in the problem that alpha equals 0.01. Our test statistic formula looks like this. It is a t-score because it's a t-test. So we have b minus beta. b, remember, is your sample slope. 
minus beta, which is the slope that we're using in our hypothesis, in our case, zero, divided by the standard error. So the standard error number is something that we've talked about in the past. It's just the standard deviation of your sample. Um, so in this case, the standard error would be s over the square root, sorry, s over the standard deviation of x times the square root of n minus 1. So you'll notice that this formula is similar to the overall sampling distribution for beta. It's just because it's a population here. Um, when we deal with a sample, it's n minus 1 instead of just n, and then obviously sample standard deviations instead of the population standard deviation. So um, then using our, because it's a t-score, we need a degrees of freedom. Because we have two variables here, um, n minus 2 is what we're using as our degrees of freedom instead of just n minus 1. So obviously it's nice that we know the formulas, but really we have our calculator do all the work for us. So here we go. Using my calculator, I already have all my data typed into stat, so I'm just going to go into stat tests, and then I'm going to scroll up because it goes a little bit faster. We're looking for the LINREG t-test. And then underneath, you'll also see the LINREG t-interval. We'll use that and talk about that in a little bit. But the t-test, um, so we want our x list to be L1, y list to be L2. Cool frequency is always going to be 1. And then here, our problem was that, uh, or for our alternative hypothesis, it was less than 0. OK, go down and calculate. Fantastic. So t is our test statistic, so negative 3.22 if we round. Our p-value is here. Degrees of freedom is 17 because we had 19 data points, so minus 2 would be 17. And then they even give us our least squares regression line, so they give us a, they give us b. s is our standard deviation of the residuals. Uh, they even calculate r and r squared for us. That's the correlation and the coefficient of determination. All right, but really, we don't really need all that stuff. So. I filled in our test statistic of negative 3.22 and degrees of freedom of 17. And then we'll go ahead and also write out our odds. So this was the p-value that t is less than negative 3.22. And we got 0 0.0, forgot what it was, 0 0.003 which is a really small p-value, so we get to make our conclusion. All right, so writing out our conclusion, we would say our p-value of 0 0.003 is less than alpha equals 0 0.01. We would reject HO. There is convincing evidence that, and then whatever was our HA. So there is a neg negative linear relationship between alcohol consumption and heart disease death rate. Interesting. So it sounds like the, if it's a negative relationship, then that means... Um, as you decrease your alcohol consumption, then that heart disease death rate will also decrease. Makes sense, logically. All right, all right. so sometimes um, instead of giving you the set of data to work with in order to do your hypothesis test, sometimes the problem will already give you the computer output. Um, so basically what we would be able to see in our calculators um, when we do the LINREG t-test, but instead they would have done it for you and wouldn't have given you any data. So this is usually what the output kind of looks like. Um, there might be slight differences here and there in terms of the layout, but all the information given here should be what you should be seeing as well um, for whatever output that they give you in a problem. So we just need to be able to read this correctly because all of this in here already gives us the test statistic and the p-value so that we can come to the same conclusion. Um, a lot of times if they give you this output and don't give you the set of data, um, they'll already say that the assumptions or conditions have been met and so you don't actually have to check for them because it's already given to you. So in this example of computer output, this does not correlate with the same problem that we were doing earlier. I just wanted an example to show you guys how to read it. So um, what we've already used in previous chapters in terms of these printouts is that first column under co -E, like coefficient. Um, and remember, the constant is the a part of the least squares regression line. So when we do y hat equals a plus bx, this would be a plus b 
x, whatever the x variable is. And remember, the x variable is always listed out here in the, like, uh, in words. Um, so for this problem, it was the drop height as the x variable, and for this example, is flight time, that was the y variable. But um, that part we already know how to use. Um, and then they also give us r squared here, which is helpful for correlation, but not so much for our hypothesis tests. So now what we need is our test statistic and p-value. That's what these last two columns over here are for. Um, so t for test statistic, p for p-value. Um, they give you two numbers for each. We only use one set, and it's only the second row. So think about it as going along with the x variable. Because we are dealing with a set of data, we want to make sure we use the x variable for whatever. Um, so our test statistic here would be 28.37. The p-value would be 0. A couple other numbers that are important that are new in this printout is this number right here. So it's under the column SE coefficient. The SE stands for standard error. And that standard error is from our test statistic formula. It's this part right here. So they're already calculating this part for you, and they're saying it's that number. Um, if you were to calculate it on your own, it would be this formula, but they've already done it for you. So that number is also good to know. And then the other number that we also need is this last one over in this lower right-hand corner here. It says S equals whatever. This is the standard deviation of the residuals. So in our SE standard error formula, it's this, this top number right here, the standard deviation of the residuals. So this printout also comes in handy, especially when we need to make a confidence interval. So anytime you're asked to make a confidence interval, obviously you have to follow the panic process. So um, the parameters, the assumptions and conditions are the same thing that we've done in our hypothesis test. The name would be the linear regression t interval. The interval itself, the formula looks like this. So remember, we have our sample slope plus or minus t star times SEB, which is our standard error. So if they give you this printout, then the standard error would just be this number under SE coefficient. And again, it's the second one. Always use the second row. Um, and then like for this problem, the sample slope would be the number that's B, which is this 0.0057244. Um, this T star is something you need to be able to find. So keep in mind for linear regression, anytime we do a T test or a T interval, you're using a degrees of freedom of N minus two. So whatever size your sample is, subtract that by two, and then use your TCDF in the calculator to be able to find um, the T star, or use your T distribution table. All right, the last thing I want to talk about in this video um, is just inter important interpretations that we need to know dealing with this chapter. Um, so because this is the linear regression chapter um, with hypothesis tests involved, um, this there's a lot of interpretations needed for both. So old ones include the y-intercept, the slope, confidence interval, confidence level. So all of those are old inter interpretations. It's the same as before. The standard error of this specific chapter would sound something like this. If we repeated the study, whatever it was, many times, uh, the slope, wow, I can spell, of the sample regression line would typically vary by about whatever number your standard error is from the slope of the true regression line for predicting your y variable from x. So remember, every time you do an inter interpretation, you have to have the context of the problem in it, and that's why we have the y and x plugged in. Um, the other thing that you need to know the interpretation for is the standard deviation of the residual. So that was the s value, um, this one down here in, a, in the printout. The size of a typical prediction error um, is the keywords there when using the regression line to predict y from x is, and then whatever the number is. All right. That's it for this last video of your year. Oh my goodness, we made it. So um, thank you for watching it all. I know this video is long. It's a, it's a large section, um, but you did it. You did it for the whole year. You watched all my videos. Uh, I would like to give you a little opportunity for some extra credit again. So since you made it this far, go ahead and leave me a comment in your Canvas assignment. Um, just a smiley face, maybe like five smiley faces, you know, however you feel about finishing the curriculum um, for some extra credit. If you are not in my class, I'm so sorry, I can't offer you any extra credit, but maybe you can leave a smiley face in the comment and just, or as a comment to this video, and I'll, I'll give you a compliment, I guess. 
I don't know. We'll see. Alrighty. Thank you for watching again. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Share this with all your friends who are taking AP statistics. Maybe that this will help them. And again, it was what an interesting year. Alrighty. Thanks for watching. Bye.